Hey, welcome to It's Probably Not Rocket Science, a University of New Mexico podcast. I'm your host, Carly Bowling, and today we have a very special episode for you. It's about space in the James Webb Space Telescope. For the first time on this show, we might actually be approaching rocket science. We have two guests today. First, we'll hear from Dr. John C. Mather, a Nobel laureate, senior astrophysicist with NASA, and the longtime senior project scientist for the telescope. We'll talk with him about the telescope's findings, if we'll find aliens in space, and what astrophysicists think about astrology. Then we'll hear from Tony Hall, a UNM adjunct professor who led the team that polished and shaped the 18 mirrors featured in the telescope. I hope you'll stick around as we explore topics and images from the depths of the universe. Let's get into it. Thank you for talking with me today. Well, thank you for inviting me to be here with you. Of course. I would love to just start by having you kind of tell me a little bit about that first initial project that made such a splash, the COBE well, the COBE satellite was called the Cosmic Background Explorer. We were trying to measure the cosmic heat of the Big Bang. So the early universe was very hot and condensed and compressed. So it was very, very hot and the heat should still be here somewhere. That is to say everywhere. So look in any direction, you should be able to pick it up. So this was proven by observation in 1965 and a Nobel Prize was given for the discovery. And then my chance came to say, well, let's measure it really, 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 really well. So I worked on that as a thesis project in Berkeley, and that project did not function properly. Nevertheless, I got a job at NASA, and a few months later, NASA said, we want proposals for new satellite missions. I said, boss, my thesis project failed. We should try it in outer space. He said, we'll call up our friends, we'll write a proposal, and it worked. So a few years later, that is to say 15 years later, uh, our satellite idea was launched into space and it measured the Big Bang. Wow. What were the findings? Well, two things. Uh, number one, it has the right color. That is to say no color. It's uh, uh, pure heat radiation coming from a hot object of the earliest moments. So we measured the temperature. It's 2.7 degrees Kelvin. Very, very chilly from our perspective, but still it's most of the radiation of the universe is in that form. Um, and then we made a map. Is it equally bright in all directions? And the answer is no, not quite. Uh, and that turned out to be really, really important because those hot and cold spots that we saw relate to density changes in, in the early universe. And that's important because those made it possible for us to exist. The expansion was happening, has been happening all these many billions of years, but something had to be able to stop the expansion locally so that the gaseous material could be pulled back together to make galaxies and stars and planets and people. And so we're here because of those spots. Wow. What was the problem with the initial project that you had worked on your thesis? Oh, uh, well, number one, it was a small project, the first one of its type, and uh, we didn't test it enough. So that's why it failed. Um, and there was a test that we should have done that we could never have thought of either because it related to how do you launch a balloon payload. Oh, and wow. and it, was a, it was a small object, about eight foot cube, that uh, went up on a long, long rope under a high altitude balloon. Okay. And we launched it in Texas. And it went up and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. What? It's a sinking feeling. But anyway, you pick up your books and go home and you fix it. And then the next time it worked. That's awesome. How many people worked on the satellite that uh, went up? That, that one, oh, the, the thesis project was just like three. Okay. Uh, the satellite, 1,500. Wow. <laughs> so that's how we got it right the next time. Yeah, that makes sense. How did it feel to win the Nobel Prize? Well, it was a, it was a tremendous acknowledgement for our team. Yeah, when you get 1,500 people working together, it's a family project. It's a team project. So we knew we had done a good job, and now everybody knew. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so I heard in one of your previous presentations that you had about a day to put together the proposal for the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, well, that's a it's not a complete proposal. But yes, I got a phone message one day. Um, Would you like to join the Webb Telescope team? Uh, it wasn't called that yet. And if so, then please call us up because we need a proposal tomorrow. 
So wow. this was just a formality to get a project started. Somebody had received some money to start it with. They needed somebody to spend it on, and and I and the project manager were going to do this together. So that was how that started. But it, of course, grew very quickly to involve much more money and many more people. Huge industrial collaborations were required to put this thing up in space. Absolutely. I saw that there were 20,000 people who worked on the James Webb Space Telescope, and the telescope itself had 300 points of potential failure when it launched? Yes, it did. That's a lot of moving parts. How did that work? Well, those are called single point failures, which means if that particular item doesn't work, you're dead. Wow. So how do you make sure that they don't fail? Uh, well, two things. Uh, number one, you have to test the design by practicing. You unfold it, unfold it up, unfold it and fold it up, and you test it cold. You test all the things you could possibly test on the ground. And then you have two of everything if you possibly can. So there are a few things you can't, but most things you can have two of them. Uh, two sets of electronics, two sets of ways to set off each actuator, two, two transmitters, two receivers, all those kinds of things you can have two of, you do. Uh, we get as many friendly, grouchy people together to tell you when you're doing it wrong. We really need that. And it feels terrible, but it's really <laughs> important. And then you just have to have really good process control. So how do you make sure your parachute always works? You make sure you always do it the same way that you did it last time. And so that's what we had to do for those kinds of things. How many years did you spend just doing that testing process? The testing is continuous from beginning to end. As soon as you have an idea, you make a thing and you build it and it doesn't quite work right. But you say, I'll, I'll fix it and I'll make it better. So we have to learn by building and testing from the beginning. You can't draw something and have it work. So, of course, when you have a big project like this, uh, you can't really plan in advance all the bad things that are going to happen to you. So at a certain point, we realized we didn't have enough money in the budget. And uh, it looked like the project could be canceled. Oh, no. So what, what happens then? Uh, Senator Mikulski wrote us a letter and said, please make us a plan we can count on. So um, we got committees, outside committees, to review our work. And they came back and said, did great work, did not ask for enough money. And with that kind of information, she was able to get the Senate and the Congress to agree to send the money that it would really take to do the job after we'd been given the chance to make a real good plan. And we were able to stick to that pretty well, uh, even though we had a pandemic after that. Wow. So we, we weren't quite as fast as we thought we would be, but uh, we got it up there just about on the budget that we had hoped for at that point. So uh, it takes uh, not only the dedicated team, but also the backing of the public to be able to afford to do it right. Absolutely. The The telescope ended up launching on December 25th, 2021. And I heard that actually um, because of the level of fuel that was used in the initial launch, is it possible the telescope will be up in space for twice the time that yes, it was initially? Yes, we're hoping for 20 more years of operations, wow. which means uh, it's working well. Uh, nothing bad has happened to us, uh, not really. And uh, the launch was almost perfect. And in fact, I actually have a video of what was supposed to happen when the launch occurred. You've called it your scary movie, but if you want to just kind of watch this and explain yes. to me what's happening and why it's so scary. Okay, well, of course, the, what we needed to do was to get a gigantic telescope in space that was much larger than the rocket itself. So it's all folded up like a butterfly in its little chrysalis um, to be unfolded after launch. So the mirror is uh, 21 feet across, and the diameter of the rocket fairing is about 15 feet. Wow. Oh, so there's a lot of folding going on. And the umbrella, what we call the sunshade, is as big as a tennis court. That's even more difficult to fold up. So very elaborate uh, origami problem. So we uh, fold it up, we launch it up into space, and we can't touch it at that point. But we can send commands. And so first we have to unfold the solar panels so we get electricity and the antenna so we can talk back and forth to Earth better. Uh, then gradually we unfold the sunshade, this giant umbrella, and finally we unfold the telescope itself. It's uh, got 18 hexagonal mirrors that have to fo focus and function as though they were one single mirror. So this process of, to get it all up and focused takes so six months, uh, which is something we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. And you know, we got it done in six months exactly on the plan. Wow. What We should talk about what are the uh, things you're trying to observe. Uh, we had four things in mind when we started, and uh, they were the same four things we're currently doing. Uh, number one, uh, what happened after the Big Bang? Uh, what are the first objects that grew? 
uh, galaxies we see now are pretty different from what they were then. Uh, we can tell that because we're looking back in time as we look at things that are far away. So uh, how far back can you look? Uh, well, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old, and it started making objects that we might find uh, about 100 million years later, maybe 200. So our job now is to look as far back in time as we possibly can and find those rare samples of the first things. Uh, and we're beginning, we're beginning to win. Um, so then how did the galaxies grow? We think the Milky Way, the, the Milky galaxy that we're in, was made of maybe a thousand pieces. So can we find evidence of how this happened? Not by looking only at our own Milky Way, but at looking at other galaxies way back in time. How different are they? Um, how are those stars born? So it wasn't always known that stars even were born that had a history. But now we know more or less where they're born um, inside clouds of dust and gas that uh, you can hardly see through. Uh, and so you can't see inside because they're dusty. Mm -hmm. uh, and the dust, of course, is the debris from previous generations of stars that blew up. Uh, and so anyway, this is the place to look where stars are born with planets. And finally, we want to know about the planets themselves. Uh, are there planets out there that are like Earth uh, or others that are here in our solar system? Because we kind of want to know, are we really alone or only a little bit alone? How far away could the neighbors be? Mm -hmm. So right now we're still not able to say there's another planet over there that's like Earth. We found a lot of them that are the right size and temperature. Okay. Uh, but we don't have any where we know there's an atmosphere okay. that's like Earth. And those are all findings that have stemmed from James Webb? Yes. Wow. Yeah, we, we've worked on all of these things. The, uh, the big surprise about the first galaxies is that they're brighter, bigger, hotter than we expected, and they're not round. Um, modern day galaxy is round because it's had time to sort of come to a shape. Okay. Um, we're now seeing that the first galaxies are oblong, cigar-shaped, banana-shaped, uh, twisted in various ways, and we're just getting to begin to understand how that's true. How does it work that with this telescope, you're able to see so far into what on Earth would feel like the past. Well, we're looking back in time. So how do you look at back in time? Well, you just look at things as they were when light was sent to you. So if you can look something far away, then you're looking back in time a lot. So with sound waves, you can feel this when you can hear the, hear the see the lightning flash and then you hear the sound waves coming to you later. So you're looking, you're hearing back in time okay. with sound waves that way with uh, with the universe, we only have light to go on, but uh, it has a speed of about 186,000 miles a second. And that sounds pretty fast, but it's still not fast enough that you can see instantaneously all the way back. So we look far away to see how things were when the universe was young. Okay, that makes sense. And so over time, those galaxies have kind of um, changed shape because of the because of what exactly? Yeah, well, a galaxy is uh, a collection of more or less 100 billion stars orbiting around the, some kind of common center held together by gravity. So they're all in orbit. So it's all pretty complicated. Um, some of them are round. Some of them are football shaped. Uh, some of them are uh, pinwheels like our Milky Way, a spiral galaxy. And it's hard to tell that for our own because we're living in the middle of it. You can't stand outside to look at the pattern, but we can calculate that. Other ones are easier to see, and they're really pretty. I wanted to show you a couple of these photos and have you just kind of explain what we're looking at. So this was one of the ones that came out first that's mm -hmm. beautiful. What exactly are we seeing? Right. We're looking at a picture called the Cosmic Cliffs. The blue area at the top is an area where brand new stars have just been formed, and they are so bright that they're pushing away all the dusty clouds that they were formed in. And the bottom half is the dusty cloud where new stars are being born as we speak. So this is a, 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 a nursery for new stars. Cool. And so we're seeing a wind that comes from above and pushes on things. You can see a little prong sticking up from the cloud and the wind is blowing a wake around the, those little objects. We're using this cloud as a laboratory to find out how are stars like the sun born and do they have planets and all those kinds of things we want to know. What is our own history? And this is a place to find out. Now, this one is interesting. This one's called a, a Southern Ring Planetary Nebula. And it's called a planetary nebula because astronomers thought it looked like a planet, but it's not. It's a cloud surrounding stars that are disintegrating. So right down there in the middle is a star that's in the process of dying. 
which means it's pushing its surface out into space in puffs. And so this intricate shape that we see represents the history of the death of a star. Wow. And so we're looking in there, and the Webb telescope gives us new information because it can see different chemistry and also things that are too cold to emit their own light. So now we think down in the core are actually five stars, and that's why the shape is so strange. If it was just a single star, it might be just a sphere. But now with the five stars in there, it's all these things with wrinkles in it. I wanted to ask you a little bit about how the telescope is able to see through those dust clouds, right? And it's the first of its kind Mm -hmm. to be able to see through the Mm -hmm. dust where Mm -hmm. stars form. Yeah. So it's actually not the first one we've had that could observe at the right wavelength, but it's much more powerful than the earlier ones. We had one that was called the Spitzer Space Telescope, and the mirror was about uh, almost three feet across. And now the new one is... 21 feet across. Wow. So that's much, much more powerful. And we have a new generation of detectors also, so they're much more sensitive. Um, But anyway, why do we want to do infrared astronomy? Three reasons. Uh, Number one, um, infrared comes from objects that are not warm enough to send out visible light. Uh, Number two, the universe is expanding in the sense that distant galaxies are running away from us. So the light that they send out comes to us as longer wavelengths than it was when it started. And the third one is to look inside these dusty clouds. And so how can infrared see inside a dusty cloud? Well, light's a wave, and that means uh, it can go around obstacles. Um, If you you have a a light wave that's where the wavelength is small compared to the object, then it bounces off. Um, If the light wave is large compared to the object, then it can go around and reform itself. So we can see through dust clouds that way. Wow. So when these initial images came out, I think it was in 2022, they look like paintings. I mean, they're so gorgeous. And I know that there was work that went into those um, before they were released to the public. But what did it feel like to, as the team working on the telescope, see images come back from the telescope for the very first time? Oh, my goodness. We had a ceremony where all of the engineers that were focusing the telescope and a lot of the scientists that were interested in the answer got together in one room and we we all got to see the image all at the same time. And we were breathtaking to see that. We celebrated because right away you could see not only did the telescope focus, but there are thousands and thousands of galaxies in each picture. Wow. Oh man, that's exciting. It's such a thrill. And you've spent your whole life practically working on this incredibly difficult thing. And failure would be like disaster. Absolutely. And, And we did not fail. And the pictures are beautiful. Yeah. What was the very first thing that NASA saw come back from the telescope? Well, of course, the first thing you get back are radio waves that say it's all working Um, because we communicate with the spacecraft by radio. Um, So it's engineering data. So it's not pictures yet. Then that first, the pictures are all out of focus because it's not focused yet. In fact, when we start off, there's 18 segments of the primary mirror and they're all like independent. So each one has to be adjusted to match the other 17. Wow. And so we got a pretty fancy computer program that helps us figure that out. Okay. But you start off with 18 fuzzy dots, and then you have to maneuver all of those 18 mirrors, tip, tilt, and move back and forth until all the fuzzy dots move together and they merge, and suddenly it's a lot sharper. Wow. So you get all the properties of a brilliant, wonderful telescope that's 21 feet across. Wow. (laughs) Of the images that have um, been made public, which one is your favorite? Oh, my goodness. Every day it's a different one. Uh, today I'm thinking of the beautiful pictures of the outer planets because the, you see them with their rings, like the planet Uranus. We see almost looking down at the pole of that planet wow. because the way its uh, spin axis is tilted so much. Most of the planets in the solar system, the spin axis is mostly perpendicular to the plane of the orbit. For Uranus, it's not. It's almost in the plane, so we're looking right on the pole. So we see these beautiful beautiful rings around the planet, and we see lots of little dots, and those are the satellites. There are many, many satellites of all of the outer planets. So it's beautiful to look at, and it tells us things that we care about for the history of the Earth. So you say, well, why do we care about the outer planets when Earth is right here? We want to see what was the solar system like when it was young. What were the raw materials? from which the earth was assembled. So working on that. 
It's a long story, but we're working on it. How long will it be before those answers are available? Oh, well, each observation takes quite a few months to process. Uh, people have to say, I saw this. I think the numbers are correct. Uh, let's argue about this for a while. Uh, then the write up with what we think we saw. Then we send it into a journal. And they say, nah, we better get somebody to check this. And finally, it's quite a few months between I saw something and I got it printed. That makes sense. How many um, publications have stemmed from the telescope so far? Mm. I think the last I saw, there were like 500 publications already. Wow. So, and you, you could ask, uh, how do we decide where to look? So it's not like John Mather knows where to look. Uh, we have a competition for that too. Wow. So um, every year we say, please send us your ideas. Where would you point the telescope and why? And exactly how would you do it? And so we, get, I think we got almost 2,000 proposals last time, and we choose a few hundred okay. to, uh, to fill up all the observing time that we have. Okay. Where um, are you going to be looking next with the telescope? Oh, well, every day it's a different process. Okay. Because you know, we've got this list of thousands of things to look at every year, and we, put them, we try to do it efficiently so we don't have to spend a lot of time zipping around from place to place. Uh -huh. That makes sense from the perspective of a student who wants to go into astrophysics, who's looking at something like this and thinking, wow, that's so big. How could I ever participate in a project like that? How could I ever be the next generation that works on something like this? What advice would you give those people? Oh my goodness. Well, there's so many ways to work on these big projects. Um, if you're a student now, you can use this telescope now by writing a proposal. So approximately 10% of the proposals we chose were written by graduate students. Wow. So you can do it now if you're a student. Um, if you're planning to build something, then you want to study some engineering probably because most of the team members that um, built the telescope are engineers or technicians. Uh, they know how to actually make something that works and I only know how to ask for it. <laughs> so I can, I can say why we need it, uh, what we'll get if we do it, uh, but some, it's a whole other territory to know how to build something or even to manage a team that can do that. So. It's a, to me, it's almost magic that we can organize uh, 20,000 people to do something this big and have it work. Absolutely. But it's, uh, it's uh, actually a, a serious subject to study. Definitely. If you hadn't gone into astrophysics, what would you have gone into? Mm. Uh, well, it's hard to tell. The world was completely different when I was a person. We didn't even have a space age yet when I was born. And, uh, and so it might have been something completely different. I was interested in radios and electronics and physics of various kinds. I thought uh, quantum mechanics and, gra and relativity were really cool. And they still really are. Um, and they're still really mysterious. And there's still life in that subject. Uh, we are learning how to make quantum this and that for computers. And some of my friends that worked at NASA have gone off to make qubits wow. for quantum computers. So there are a lot of random seeming things that connect. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we actually have a few just kind of rapid fire questions okay. that I would love to ask you. Sure, go ahead. Um, they're a little bit more casual. Do you think that we will find life in outer space or aliens? I think we will find life. I think we will find signs of microbial life, tiny life. When we think of aliens, uh, we're probably the most alien thing there is <laughs> uh, because we've been invading everything here on Earth that we can. I think personally that the guess is life will occur everywhere that there is water at the right si temperature. So that we see life everywhere here on Earth where it's wet. So why wouldn't that be in outer space? So there are planets around other stars and surely some of them must be wet. And we haven't proven that yet. Here on in the solar system, we have other places to look. Mars has ice, probably might have water underneath the surface, wow. liquid water. Um, there are at least two satellites in the solar system that have significant amounts of liquid water over, uh, covered over by an ice surface. And we're sending a probe to find out if there uh, are any organic molecules coming out of the one around Jupiter. It's called Europa. And we know it's got ice and we know it spits up water. So let's go find out what's in the water. You answered my next question, which is where do you think that we will find life if we do? Um, I guess, how long do you think something like that would take? Mm. Uh, it's a few decades to really get sh sure about anything. So uh, we're already collecting rocks on the surface of Mars to bring home. So if any of them have signs of microbes in them, we'd be thrilled and uh, pro pro probably convinced. 
if we see uh, serious organic chemistry coming out of the other liquid places in the solar system, we might be convinced. We'd really like to get a sample and bring that home, but that's pretty hard. Sure. If we see oxygen in the atmosphere of another planet or of similar properties to Earth, along with water and a few other organic molecules, we could say that's pretty so strong signs of life somewhere else. It won't tell you anything much about it except photosynthesis. Because here on Earth, oxygen comes entirely from, from photosynthesis and it's very reactive. It will all disappear in a hurry mm -hmm. if there were no sunshine. So we know that. So look for that. Yeah. Um, my next question is, what's your favorite fact about space? My favorite fact about space? It's pretty darned empty. <laughs> uh, it's a really, really, really long distance to the nearest other place. So the moon is 240,000 miles away, and it's a, it's a very small object, and uh, Mars is millions of miles away at their nearest. It would take four years traveling at the speed of light to get to the nearest other star besides the sun. Wow. So we're not going there. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but uh, we don't have any hint of how to make warp drive or any of those other things we have on television all the time. Darn. Well, another question I wanted to ask is, what is the most accurate space movie that you've seen? The Mac most accurate space movie? Mm, I can't say there are any really accurate <laughs> space movies because to tell, tell a good story, you have to make up something that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite space movie? Well, it's not really a space movie, but a long time ago, there was something called Forbidden Planet, in which uh, people arrive at a planet that has been previously occupied, and there's nobody there. And it turns out to be dangerous all the same. Imagine yourself as one of the crew of this faster-than-light spaceship of the future. This Forbidden Planet has been hollowed out and filled up with the equipment to, as it turns out, to make people's ideas become true. Wow. And it's dangerous. I'm going to check that movie out. So my next question is, how likely is an asteroid collision with Earth? Oh, we've had asteroid collisions. Uh, the last whopper was 66 million years ago, and that uh, coincides with the demise of the dinosaurs. We had a pretty big one in uh, Tunguska in Siberia about 1903, was it? And um, that wiped out uh, trees for like 15 mile radius. Wow. So that was a whopper. We had one in Chelyabinsk only a few years ago and a lot of people were killed mm. uh, because they went to look at it. And then this, the shock wave, the sound wave arrived and it broke the windows in front of them and they were killed by glass. Wow. So uh, when you, something bad happens in the sky, do not go to look. Uh, we are looking for more of those. Uh, we're just beginning to be able to see them little farther in advance. Okay. And we do already have a job from Congress of saying, find all of the really bad ones and know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So ways to destroy them, ways to divert them. Okay. Is that the DART program? Yeah, we did do that. We already dropped a probe onto an asteroid to see how much it would move when we hit it. And it moved farther than it would go if it was just billiard balls colliding because some of the kinetic energy of the impact was turned into a debris that came flying back out, and it caused a, an additional push on the, on the asteroid, about five times as much as it would have been. Wow. So that's good to know. You hit something, it'll move. Yeah. And farther than you were expecting. Okay. So my next question is, if given the opportunity, would you go to space? I don't know if I would or not, because it's uncomfortable, and you have to be able to tolerate zero gravity. Uh, Two-thirds of the people can't. Wow. So that means they get sick. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do that. So you have to know in advance. Stephen Hawking got his zero-gravity flight and he loved it. Have you ever thought about doing a zero-gravity flight? Not really. <laughs> no, it would be interesting, uh, but I've been busy with other things. Absolutely. That makes sense. So this next one is a little bit silly, but as someone who has studied space, what are your thoughts on astrology and the zodiac signs? My goodness. Well... For many, many thousands of years, astrology and astronomy were the same thing. People believed that the patterns in the sky would control our fate, and probably not the patterns in the sky, but something mysterious does seem to manage our fate. Uh, now we would say, well, it's the patterns of our genes and our chromosomes, and uh, we don't know how that works, and uh, our environment. Uh, so to me, I'd say it's much more random than people imagine. So I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> Do you know your zodiac sign? Yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to be a Leo. 
Okay. My late wife said that explains why I was so bossy. (laughs) As you've learned more about the universe, have you felt smaller or um, less consequential, or have you felt more consequential within this Mm. vast universe? Mm, Well, some people can take either perspective. Uh, From one perspective, life in general is a skin disease on a small, ridiculously unimportant planet. And another perspective, this is the way that the universe becomes conscious of itself. So my perspective is, well, we're right here in the middle, and uh, we are important to each other. And uh, what we do makes a difference in the future. So no reason to think we're not important. Even if we're small, we are mighty. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to look at it. Do you have any advice for students today? Hmm. In general, the world is changing quickly, so um, you cannot make a plan that lasts for very long. So be alert to changes and opportunities as they appear. And number two, ask for help. Uh, Do not be one of those people who has to just figure it all out him or herself alone. Our world is very social. The scientific world is extremely social. We do not go off in the corner and think. We talk to people all day long. (laughs) Are there examples of times that you've asked for help during your career that have made a huge difference? I'd say it's more that I I realized afterwards that I should have asked for help uh, many times because if you think you have to invent something that's already invented, that's a waste of time. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to say? Mm. I'd like to remind people that we've demonstrated that we can do ridiculously difficult projects successfully. 20,000 people worked together to get something that had hundreds of ways that we could fail and it all worked. So if we really put our minds to it, we can accomplish amazing things here on Little Earth, and we might as well try. The James Webb Space Telescope is an incredible scientific instrument that allows us to peer 13 and a half billion light years into the past and photograph the origins of the universe. But the telescope is also proof of the power of collaboration, requiring decades of work and 20,000 people. In our next interview, we dive into what it was like to work on one of the core pieces of the telescope and what role the mirrors play in capturing those beautiful images that we just reviewed. We'll even get tips on how to clean a phone from from the man who was in charge of polishing the multi-million dollar mirrors for the telescope. Tony Hull is a UNM adjunct professor of physics and astronomy, as well as a space instrumentation consultant who formerly served as the director of large optics and JWST program manager at Tinsley, which is a complicated way to say that he led the team that polished these mirrors for years. He and Dr. Mather actually became friends while they were working on the telescope. Tell me a little bit about Uh, what you did with the James Webb Space Telescope and what you do at UNM now. Very good. Well, thank you. Well, I'm Tony Hull. I'm adjunct professor of physics and astronomy here at at UNM, which I enjoy very much. Um, I am very much involved in instrumentation in space today, but I did have uh, the opportunity to um, just have a five-year tenure directing the polishing of all the mirrors on web and serving as its program manager. And that was quite the experience. Can you tell me when that was that you were working on web? Yes. I started in, in 2004. And prior to that, I had been at, Jess, at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. So I, I'd been recruited to go and lead the, uh, the web project at the company that had the responsibility for polishing the mirrors in the Bay Area. And um, so eventually I made the decision to leave this wonderful playground called Jet Propulsion Lab <laughs> and, and move up to Northern California and go more into a managerial role. Uh, but I had the cognizance and responsibility for polishing each of the, the web mirrors. So web has 18 mirrors, correct? It does. Um, what role did they play with the telescope? Well, that they are the heart of the telescope. Uh, they are, they are, the 18 mirrors are arrayed in a way, and they're moved in concert with each other, so they act as one single mirror that would be about six and a half meters in diameter. These mirrors are the mirrors that form the images that you see. So each of these 18 mirrors is 1.5 meters from point to point, about like this. Wow. And they're made out of the metal beryllium. And they're extremely light. They have to be polished exquisitely. And each one has a slightly different shape to it to make it all act as a single mirror. 
what was the process like for polishing the mirrors? I think, you know, for someone imagining it, you might think of like, cleaning things or but uh, this was a years long project so what what did it well, look well, like well it, it's over 5 years long we put in a facility to do this we're developing special machines to do this uh, just developing the special machines involved over 20 million dollars of expenditure wow to, to do this and we had to refacilitize a building and and we had to have every move with these mirrors mechanized nobody would carry these around even though I could carry one, you could carry one, they were that light, but, but that never happened. We had to be to take ex exquisite care of the mirrors. There were 334,000 operations, any of which could have broken a mirror. Wow. We broke none. Wow. <laughs> but we had to go to extreme measures to be sure that that happened. If one had been lost, it's not just a matter of being lost, but there might have been a very long delay in the program to go way back to square one mm -hmm. and make new material and machine the material and then and then bring it into optical polishing, et cetera. So uh, it would be extremely expensive to the program where every other phase of the program would be delayed. So that could, that could cost, if we'd lost one, the cost to NASA and the country could have been in the several hundred million dollar domain. Wow. I, I never figured that one out, but it's a, it's a lot of money. So we had to be exquisitely careful, and I'm happy to report we broke zero mirrors. Do you have any opinions on cleaning or cleaning your phone? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> and the last time I tried to clean something for somebody, I messed it up, but that's another story. Oh, no. <laughs> You're, because they, it had a soft coating on it. And generally, what I like to do is, is to, to use an alcohol wipe on it. First of all, you blow the dust off and then you very carefully wipe it with, with alcohol. And, but that's not good for everything, like my friend's sunglasses that had a soft coating and it dissolved in the alcohol. They were not happy with me. Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, so you know, what, what do I know? But uh, I, I do know that, that cleaning, if you want to do it at the highest level, you have to be sure that everything around it, first of all, you want no particles on it because you'll scratch it if you have particles. So you want to blow the particles off. Second of all, if you use a wipe, you want to, you do not want to use, um, you know, average uh, tissue because this contains oils of different kinds, mm -hmm. which would redeposit. You actually want to use oil extracted wipes or fabric that's been very soft fabric that's been washed, uh, microfibers washed several times, mm -hmm. and then you bring, move it very carefully uh, with a little bit of pressure over the surface and that's the best way i know to get things things clean if if in fact uh, you have very difficult things there are certain mild detergents you can use also followed by by a deionized water rinses what did you use to clean the mirrors we were polishing bare brilliant and we did not want to do anything that would uh, would be reactive to the brilliant so it's very different than than the the phone that we're talking about, but think of me, think of us doing something very similar to what I described. Yeah. What was it like working on something that you knew would be eventually going into space and delivering such uh, amazing uh, results? Well, the results are even more amazing than we envisioned, <laughs> but we, we knew it was important. And this was true for everyone on the project. You, you know, at every capacity, the the, the technicians, the engineers, the janitors, the uh, quality control people, uh, everybody felt a sense of mission that we were doing something great, something that is defining of our worldview in, in this century. Do you have a favorite memory from your time working on the mirrors and the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, I have so many. It, it was was very rich. We were able to change the culture to make it very... Um, very much oriented towards the people that did touch labor. And when we made these adjustments, the error rates went way, way down. And and it was basically respecting the people for, for feeling the passion that they did for building these and recognizing their expertise. We actually had the technicians rewrite all the procedures wow. that the engineers had written. They all were better. And guess what? The technicians then owned the procedures and if somebody started doing something wrong, they'd say, hey, no, Tony, uh, we agreed to do it that way. But a, a number of things like that made a, made a really big cultural difference. 
and I could see the pride of people. I mean, the passion. Yeah, definitely. That that would come out, and and everybody cared. I had fifty eight people working on this, and every one of them cared, and that was a beautiful thing. Yeah. What was a day of working with these materials like? The day sort of never ended because we had we had three shifts <laughs> around the clock. And there were times when I would get calls at four in the morning that machine number four is, is sounding a little strange, Tony, what should we do? And things like that. Uh-huh. We did a number of things to uh, make sure that everybody was comfortable on this. There are times when any of us would not want to touch a um, multi-million dollar mirror. You know, let's say somebody was stopped by, had a traffic stop on the way into work. Did I want them handling something that would cost $10 million if they, they glitched? No. Would they want to do it? No. There are other things that they could do. And so we made, uh, we, made, we made it very comfortable for people if they were not ready for any reason, had a bad night's sleep, had a fight with their spouse or whatever, their mind wasn't on it. Okay, we have other things to work on. We, 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 we don't want you touching the mirror today. And, and that was, um, I think, a very nice thing in that people cared and 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 uh, making something like this is people. We can do we can develop all sorts of machines, but ultimately it's people. Yeah. There's another interesting aspect. This material brilliant um, has um, a toxic characteristic. There's a disease called brilliosis, hmm. where very small particles of brilliant, if they're inhaled, can cause a scarring of, of the lungs and a, a decrease of the pulmonary uh, efficiency. And different people have different susceptibilities for it. Before anybody was allowed in the factory, they had to be tested for susceptibility. And we had to be sure that, uh, that it was not likely that there would be a problem. Yeah. We had zero problems with all the hours over the, the five years I was That's there. Great. We had zero problems with that, but we had to be mindful. But again, the cleaning... Um, you know, it, it's a dirty process. I mean, polishing is basically mud, if you want to think of it that way. Mm-hmm. Very highly refined mud. As a matter of fact, when I would buy the polishing solutions, I had to go and qualify each one of them on, on a test piece before I could use them on the real mirrors. Mm-hmm. Just in case some had changed the chemical composition or there was a little bit, a little bit grittier than it should be or something like that, we literally went through the test to make sure that everything was... Um, done the right way. Yeah. When we're thinking about the polishing of the mirrors, are, are you essentially creating the yes. reflective nature? Okay. Well, we're, we're creating the shape of the mirror. Okay. The mirrors are initially machined. They would come to me from a machine shop, and there would be you know all the tool marks that you would expect from that. And so we use a progression of abrasives in slurry to go in and, and remove the various features from machining, remove any subsurface damage from the machining. It's iterative, so so literally there are hundreds of cycles of making and making a mirror of you know putting it on the polishing machine and taking it to the the lab for either uh, either a measuring machine or when you get more refined the optical interferometer test. And you do it back and forth and back and forth. But that's what it is. We're, we're, we're shaping the mirror. We call it polishing, but it, it's, far more than, it's far more than making it shiny. We're creating, the shape, we're, we're creating the shape of the mirror. The machine shop may be machining at, at the level of, let's say, a, a thousandth of an inch. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, are, we are taking it this thousands of times farther to get the perfect shape. You know, down down to near atomic dimensions. So wow, I, I know that twenty thousand people in total, um, maybe more, worked on the James Webb Space Telescope. What did it feel like to be part of something so huge? Well, I I don't think I ever did the number count uh, of, of that, but I knew the importance of it. You know, as, as an astronomer, I knew what this meant. As an instrument developer, I knew what this meant. And this was, um, it was my moment. I mean, everything I'd done in my life was a build towards that. Yeah. As an astronomer, what does this telescope mean? Well, well, first of all, the pictures. You have to look at the pictures. And then, you know, and they blow everybody away. They blow me away, I know. And, and um, 
I just watch people luxuriating, just, just getting lost in them. But then there's, what does it mean? We're seeing things, we're seeing through dust, we're seeing things at distances that have never been seen before. And we're noticing, hey, this is not quite like what we expected. And so little things are happening which will change uh, our assumptions, it will change our, our, our models of, how, of what the science of the, of the universe is in every way, from the early universe, which was the primary goal, to, you know, Webb was designed to be the first telescope to see the first galaxies, um, the first light from the first galaxies in the emerging universe. It's doing that. We've never seen these things before. And, and we're seeing that they don't look like what we expected. They're, they're, they're not spheres. They're little cigars floating out there. They're, they're totally different. Uh -huh. And we're seeing, uh, we're looking through dust because in the infrared, you also can look through dust. And we're seeing all sorts of things that are happening in the birth of stars and the birth of, uh, of solar systems uh, that we'd only imagined before. But here we have, we have um, pictures that are revealing the secrets of the universe to us. That's amazing. What universal space questions do you have that you would like to see answered by the James Webb Space Telescope? Uh, okay. Well, I think the main, the main thing that, that caught my attention is, of course, the, uh, the, the principal intention of that, to look at the very early universe and to see that what the structure is like there, that this is probably the principal thing. Though I have to say, much closer to home, I'm blown away by the images. Webb looked at Jupiter. The images are astounding. You, I never saw Jupiter this way before. So there are things that, that are total surprises. It's doing magnificent things with exoplanets now, which is one, one of my loves, one of my specialties. But it's doing it differently than, than I have been doing it. Instead of doing direct imaging, which, which I'm aiming at, at doing and was working on in the past, they're doing transit observations where the planet passes in front of its, uh, its sun in the line of sight. And as it does this, we get a glimpse of its atmosphere um, by the starlight projecting through that. And we can see what elements are in the atmosphere. And we can look for signatures of life and signatures of the possibility of life wow. that way. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. And, and this is much more than I expected. I thought, oh, this would be a fairly minor aspect. No, it's big time. I, I, do you have any closing thoughts or anything you'd like to say? What could be more fun than, than to work on a project like this? It's hard work, but, but there's a, a joy in knowing that it's uh, something that matters. Thanks for joining us on our very first space episode of It's Probably Not Rocket Science. This special episode was produced specifically for Lobo Day, the University of New Mexico's annual birthday celebration. This year's Lobo Day highlighted the many people and disciplines across UNM helping to shape our understanding of outer space, from developing sustainable space technologies to helping us better understand the universe. Visit podcast.unm.edu to learn more about this research and our show. This podcast is a production of the UNM Communication and Marketing Department, so I want to give a special thank you to Steve Carr, Sarah Carsrud, Brandon Bennett, Kyler Kinsey, and all of the members of the UCAM team for their help making this episode happen. You can find more episodes of our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you may listen. We have new episodes every other Tuesday. You can also visit our website to learn more. Thanks. Thanks.